Okay, so Kim uh, mentioned earlier that if you have any questions, put them down in the chat, and we're going to take care of all the questions at the very, very end. Um, so basically just sit back, relax, listen, take whatever notes you need to. You should have received an email with, um, with a handout that has the directions for winter sowing, and then you should have received several other attachments that were plant lists. The plant lists are all from Trudy Davidoff, who, who is the woman from New York who started this method uh, many, many years ago, about 30 years ago now. Uh, this method of gardening is recognized by the USDA as a sound and good gardening practice. So you should be able to feel better about that. It's a good thing. Um, so let's get started. All right, so winter sowing um, is such a unique kind of gardening. I, I, since, since I've been a gardener for 22 years, I've been a gardener and a master gardener for 22 years. So those two things coincided. I started my career when I started gardening. Um, I didn't garden very extensively before that. Um, about 2014, 2013, I discovered winter sowing somewhere online or somebody introduced it to me. I can't, for, I can't remember actually where I heard about it. Um, but I started learning more and more about it when I joined the Facebook group, which is where most of you signed up from, or a lot of you. And that Facebook group, wintersowers.com, um, on Facebook is 62,000 people now, worldwide. So the last time I did this lecture, we actually had people from Ireland and Scotland who were on with us. And I was so excited about that. That was really fun. So if you wanna do something fun, put in the chat where you guys are from. We'll, we'll see who, who's all here and where you're from. So um, as I mentioned, this is a USDA recognized gardening practice. And the whole idea behind this is if you're like me and you have a small, old, dark house with not a lot of windows and not a lot of space, you can't start seeds indoors. I've, I tried for years and it was just a disaster every year and I really felt like a terrible gardener. So when I discovered this method and the whole idea of it is that your seeds go outdoors over winter, I was really intrigued. And once I really got into it, got a couple of years of winter sowing under my belt, got more experienced in it, um, I really felt like um, this was the only way I should grow seeds. Now in my career, I had a greenhouse where I used to work. And um, in my greenhouse, I could grow annuals by seed. I could grow tropical milkweed by seed. We used it a lot in our um, display gardens in the park district. And that those things grew really well. But I could not keep native plants alive in my 70 to 75 degree greenhouse that was too wet and too warm for native plants that like it cooler earlier on. So this, the, so the first thing that I really started experimenting with when I started winter sowing was native plants. And I got interested in native plants right along the time that I became a master gardener. I've been a member on and off uh, of um, wild ones because every once in a while I let my membership lapse, but they always let me back in. Um, I've been a member of wild ones for almost 21 years now, I think. And I've learned an incredible amount of information about plants <coughs> through that organization. And I have learned um, about starting seeds. And I think one of the most intriguing things that I've learned through Wild Ones and through some of their education programming is how to identify seedlings of certain native seeds, which is a very, very useful skill to learn. And another useful skill, if you're going to continue on with native plants, winter sowing, native gardening, uh, another useful skill would be to learn how to identify uh, when seeds are ready on native plants and how to harvest them and when to harvest them. It's really, really useful skill. So um, you can grow just about anything in winter sowing except for really temperate uh, tropical type annuals. They have a hard time with the overnight winter temperatures. Um, a few of them won't even really germinate until it's a lot warmer. So I'm going to address that in a little bit. But um, one of the big things that I really love about winter sowing is the germination rate is so high. It is 
really unusual for me to have more than 95, you know, to have about 95% germination rate in my jugs and of my jugs. So out of 84 jugs last year, uh, 80 of them germinated right away. I opened up the last three jugs and then the last, uh, and then three of those last four-ish jugs um, germinated. So I only had one true dud last year, which I was really, really happy with. Uh, the most I've ever started in one year was 140 because I was starting them for three different projects. And out of those 140, we had 120 germinate, which I thought was a really, really good rate. So you're going to get good results with this, but there's a, there's a couple little tricks and things that you need to learn in order to really ensure your success. This isn't a hard member, a hard uh, method at all, but there are some things that um, will help you along to be more successful. And that's what we're gonna do tonight. So why are we gonna winter seed? We're gonna winter seed because sowing seeds in the house is really tricky. Um, if you've had problems in the past with winter sowing, hopefully tonight you'll be able to learn a couple of things that might help you be a little bit more successful and, 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 more, and feel better and more accomplished about what you're doing. Um, the first year that I did it, I listened to all of the things that the blog writers were writing about. I did all the directions the way they wanted me to do them and I was not successful. And I skipped a year after that because I thought, well, this is kind of a kind of a dud thing. Why am I bothering? And then I tried it again and I was wildly successful that second time that I tried it and I was really happy and I haven't stopped since. So um, the idea is when you use a one gallon jug, that you're sort of making a miniature greenhouse. Um, you are, but you're not. You're, you're giving the seeds a protected space to be able to germinate and prepare and winter, uh, cold stratify over the winter, germinate at an appropriate time according to the appropriate weather and the appropriate amount of light, um, cold exposure at night, and, and a few other little elements out there that are important for seed germination. So it's important to note that, and this is a question that comes up on winter sowers a lot on Facebook. You know, if I winter sow my vegetables and I start them in January and February, am I going to get vegetables earlier? If I winter sow my flowers in January and February, am I going to get flowers sooner? And the answer to that question is most likely no. So when we get done with winter sowing at the end of the season in May, uh, for most of us, we're going to open these jugs up and we're going to start planting our, our seeds out or our seedlings out. When you plant your seedlings, whether they are transplants from a nursery, transplants that you've grown in the house, or transplants you've grown outdoors in, in a winter sowing container, the day you put that plant in the ground is the day that you start counting those days until harvest. That, that's, it says on the seed packages. You know, if it says 12 weeks until harvest for whatever, or 120 days for whatever, or 65 days for whatever, that does not start until the day that you put that plant in the ground. So really you are not, you are not to expect um, any sooner produce in your vegetable garden to come up, you know, you're not going to get peppers sooner because pepper vegetables, all vegetables, peppers included, you know, all the other ones. Getting produce from those plants is all dependent on the weather, the length of day, and that is going to go right in order with the season. So just because you've started the seeds early does not mean that you're going to get produce earlier. I hope that's clear. Um, throw a question down in the chat if you need to, if you need clarification. So um, I mentioned that this is a really good method for everything except for really, really temperate, um, or sorry, tender annuals. So what are tender annuals, hardy annuals, um, half hardy annuals? So a hardy annual is going to be an annual that has cold tolerance. So that means that that plant can go in the ground and it can withstand some cold overnight until it gets established and until it starts growing and then it's gonna start blooming and then we don't ha really have to worry about cold. So this, an example of this is going to be sweet peas. Uh, we can start sweet peas in winter sowing jugs and then they can be planted out pretty early, mid-April, uh, third week of April, fourth week of April, and then they'll start growing and, and blooming at their appropriate time. Half-hardy annual is one that can be direct sown directly into the garden 
after our last frost. So half hardy annuals can also be winter sown, but in my experience, and a lot of what's gonna be said tonight is my experience. Um, other people have had different experiences, so please keep that in mind. In my experience with half hardy annuals, if I start them later, uh, like the first week of April, the last week of March, I tend to have better germination and better performance out of those plants just because they don't have to withstand the brutal overnight temperatures that we have in um, early March and in February and January here in the Chicagoland area. For those of you that are um, out of town and you live out of state, the Wild Ones group here in Hammond, Indiana is where I live. Um, and this is near Chicago. We touch Chicago on the southeast side. And so we have the same kind of weather as Chicago. Um, so anything that I'm referring to as far as weather, uh, seasons, scheduling outside, it's going to be more geared towards zone 5B. A tender annual is an annual seed that's going to tolerate no extended cold period. So these are things like impatiens and other really tropical type plants like that. And those should be spring sown, which is going to be after the middle of May. You can still start things in jugs. And we're going to address that. It's just slightly different. We're going to address that at the end. And then um, all can be winter sown in temperate or four season climate. That's what temperate means. It means that you have a four season climate. Okay, so the advantages of, of winter sowing, there's probably more than just what's on this list, um, but you don't have to have lights, you don't have to have shelves, you don't buy, have to buy pots and trays. There's no damping off. If you've ever experienced that in the house, it's devastating when you lose all your seedlings to a fungus. Uh, less frequent watering. You do not have to harden off because as these plants germinate and grow inside of their container, then they are naturally hardened off. And so that means when you plant them out in the garden, you do not have to uh, cover them. You don't have to protect them. You don't have to pot them in a tray and protect them for a couple of weeks, nothing. They go directly into the garden and they're totally hardened off. The seedlings are gonna be weed free because you don't have anything blowing into the trays. As long as you're using good clean seed, you should have weed free seedlings. Cold stratification, you don't have to cold stratify separately in baggies and containers in the refrigerator. You don't have to buy sand for that, so that's kind of nice. Your germination rate will be high, which is great, so plan accordingly because you're going to have extra plants of everything. So make sure that you have someplace for everywhere for those to go. Uh, transplanting goes faster because you don't have to transplant or bump up to another container. Um, these seedlings can go into the ground when they're very, very small, uh, according to what Trudy does every year in her garden, and she's been doing it for about 30 years. So uh, we definitely trust her. I've never planted anything really tiny in my garden, only because um, my other plants are so big and they're so tight, and I have spring annuals, or sorry, spring bulbs everywhere. I have daffodils everywhere. So I think that if I did plant seedlings that were really, really tiny, they might get lost in there. So you kind of have to adjust for what your garden is like. So when do you start winter, winter sowing? This is probably one of the number one uh, questions on the Facebook page, which I love because it, it doesn't really matter. You can start anywhere around the winter solstice all the way through to mid-April and you can spring sow in May and June. So you can really do this anytime you want. I wanna stress that. This is not a very rigid method of seed starting. You don't have to really worry about what the back of the packages say. Um, if your native plants and your other plants that need cold stratification, if they get about eight weeks of cold overnight temperatures, then that's fine, that's great. That's really all they need. So I usually winter sow a whole batch of uh, my jugs. I use one gallon jugs and I will do a whole batch of those with the hardiest of perennials in, in January. So I do, you know, 20 or 30 in January. I do another 20 or 30 in February. <clears throat> then I hold off and do some of my annuals at the end of March and into April. And then I'm pretty much done. So I usually do my winter sowing in three groups. 
And a lot of people do it that way. And it's great because it doesn't feel so overwhelming. If my goal is to grow at least 100 species and a few of those species, I need more than one jug because I need it for plant sale, then, um, then it's going to be really overwhelming if I try and do that all in one weekend or in, in a, a day, you know. So breaking it up is good if you're going to do a lot. Um, with vegetables, it's the same deal. There's cold hardy vegetables. You put those cold hardy vegetables in containers in February and January, it's okay. The, the seeds will just sit there until they're ready to germinate. So it's not real stringent. So um, a lot of people are so worried about when to start, but really it's just, it's a matter of are your overnight temperatures cold enough to give your seeds that cold uh, period that they really, really need. So that should be, let's say temperatures below 50 for at least eight weeks would be a good way to gauge that. Okay, it's like I said, it's not stuck in concrete. Um, but your overnight temperatures do need to be cold because that's what helps the whole process happen. You're going to stop making containers for summer planting, which is what we're all, well, spring summer planting, which is what we're all growing plants for. When your spring evenings are in the 50s, they're in the low 50s. So they're a little bit too cold in the low 50s to give, um, to give your, your seeds that cold snap that they need, that stratification that they need. And uh, for us here in the Chicagoland area, the low 50s are going to be uh, early May. It's going to be the first and second week of May. So spring sowing tender annuals and perennials for fall planting can start at that time in mid-May uh, here in our zone 5B. Okay, what to plant when? Um, in January and February, like I said, perennials are great to start then. So some examples, you're going to have to refer to those sheets that I sent you if you want a really extensive list. But I mean, you really, you really don't need a list. If you know it's a perennial in your area, then you can sow it during the winter. You can sow it anywhere from January actually through March. And they'll probably still germinate in March, uh, after March, just fine. But some examples of uh, perennials that do very well with winter sowing are things like columbine and hollyhock, campanula, sweet pea is an annual, but um, we kind of throw it in there because it's so cold tolerant. Foxgloves are great for this method, lupin, balloon flower, uh, delphiniums, milkweed. There's a lot of different varieties of milkweed. Milkweed is in every state on this, on North America. There's 110 different species. Um, they're all attractive to monarchs in some way, sometimes just the flowers and sometimes the leaves. But there's uh, milkweed that is appropriate for your zone and your region. So if you are interested in attracting monarchs, make sure you look up which milkweed is for you. And if you just Google milkweed for such and such state, such and such county, the USDA website will pop up and will tell you which milkweeds are appropriate for your area. And globe thistle is another really cool plant. Um, most of these plants on this list are pollinator plants. That's what I'm mostly interested in. Uh, so you're gonna have a little bit of that tonight. We'll be talking just very, very briefly about that. Uh, all natives can be started in January and February. Uh, and of course, you know, after the winter solstice, there's been a couple of times where I've been on vacation the last half of December and been completely and utterly bored. And so I just start my winter sowing right around like the day after Christmas. So you can start that early too, if you want to. Um, hardy annuals are, include things like sweet pea, verbena, malva, Spanish flag vine, which is a really beautiful vine, snapdragons, pansies, black-eyed Susans, uh, the annual ones, poppies, calendula. They're all really relatively cold hardy. Uh, so they can be planted earlier in the, the winter. And then vegetables, all your cold season vegetables like spinach, kale, Brussels sprouts, snow peas are great, broccoli, cabbage, chard, and then perennial, um, perennial herbs like thyme, oregano, sage, and parsley are good for this. And then cilantro, I don't know why I put cilantro there. Cilantro really should be over the hump, maybe towards the end of March. Just, and, and mostly I say that for these more tender annuals, you know, plant them just slightly later, mostly because 
here in the Chicago area, we frequently have a very bad cold snap at the beginning of April, like the second week of April, the past two years we've had it, where we have had devastatingly low in the 20s temperatures and snow. And things like my zinnias were affected, my basil was affected. Even if I covered my containers, they were affected. So that's why I say maybe just push those off a little bit. But if you go on and you read uh, Trudy's directions on the Facebook page, she really does say it's okay to start all of it at once in the winter, and that's okay too. I want you to experiment, see what is appropriate for your zone, for what your environment is like, what your climate is like, and you know, maybe for some of these tender annuals, start a couple of jugs of these in the winter right now, and then hold back some seed and start a little bit in the end of March or the beginning of April and see what is better for you, for your area and your, your region, okay? Experiment and figure out what's gonna work best for you. Okay, in March, that's usually when uh, half-hardy and tender annuals get planted. This includes, for example, things like Tithonia and Cosmos, Zinnia marigolds, four o'clocks. Um, why do I have Cosmos on there twice? That's very weird and then tropical milkweed. As far as tender annuals go, um, what I wanna say about this is that this should not be the beginning of March for the Chicagoland area. This should actually be the beginning of the third week of March. Um, and right around that time is when your perennials will be starting to germinate. Uh, so this is an appropriate time to put these tender things into jugs. And the vegetables that can be put in at that time are going to be bok choy and beets and snow peas, cabbage, lettuce, more things that can take the cold. And then in April, that's when I would plant tomato and basil. Now, my experience with peppers is that they need a very, very long season. They are a perennial shrub in their natural habitat, and they need a long season of heat. And when we would plant them in the greenhouse at work for, for our community garden, we were planting them at the end of February. And we had beautiful plants by the time May came and we planted them out. So I don't know. I think that some people have success with peppers in the containers. Um, but you would probably have to throw that question up on the Facebook page and see how many people are planting peppers. Otherwise, that could be the one plant that you're going to start in the house in a sunny window if you don't need very many plants or that could be the one plant that you buy. So that's, um, that's gotta be something that you have to test out and figure out what's gonna be best for you. So here's a, just a little montage of things that you're gonna need. You're gonna need some kind of container to put your soil and your seeds in. I use jugs. Um, luckily at work I have, this year I had a really, um, great opportunity to collect these big one gallon jugs of um, not antifreeze but this um, this stuff that they put into the parks into the field houses in our parks where we have bathrooms it's um, oh god now I can't remember the word so it's a it's a product that you put into the toilets and into the sinks in these field houses and it keeps the pipes from freezing but it's safe enough to put into an RV, so into the sink pipes in an RV. So it, after it's been washed out and flushed out of the, those pipes, it's safe to drink the water. So it is safe enough for me to wash those jugs and to plant in. And I'm not planting edibles anyway, so um, I have a lot of those jugs because my coworkers saved them for me. I was very lucky. I was really happy. So that was, that was great. Um, the reason why I like milk jugs is because they kind of have that shoulder on them. The, um, the opening at the top is a really nice natural vent to let the hot air out. That is, um, when there's too much hot air inside the vent, it has to be released. And that's kind of why people think of it as a miniature greenhouse. But the thing that I like is that the shoulders are there on those containers and the, the condensation just rolls down those um, shoulders and down into the soil and the water will water the plants. And it's a nice thing because they have a handle. Once you tape them up, you can move them around by holding them by the handle. It's 
very convenient. Um, I tend to be shuffling my jugs around all the time during the winter and the spring. So it's, for me, it's convenient, but there's a lot of other containers out there that you can use. I'm gonna show you some examples. So other things that you're going to need, you're going to need some kind of tape. The tape that's in this picture is from ACE. It's called poly tape. I have really good success with poly tape. It's UV resistant and it sticks really well. As long as your jug is very, the outside of your jug is dry when you go to put it on. Um, you will need a couple of one liter bottles to water your jugs with, and we're gonna address that in a little bit. Uh, coffee filters are helpful. I'm gonna explain that in a minute. Of course, you need your seeds, whether they be collected or something that you buy, it does not matter. You need some utility scissors that can cut through the plastic. You need a utility knife, plant tags, and but plant tags, you can buy plant tags. I have some purchased ones down there under my marker. On the left are ones that I purchased. On the right are just little plastic knives, which I've used in the past also, and they work just fine. Um, and they're super cheap. They're much cheaper than the plant tags. And then the garden marker that I have there is a product called the garden marker. And honestly, that is the best UV resistant marker I've ever used. I've used it for 15 years in my greenhouse at work and have been really, really happy with it the entire time that I've used it. Um, a good fresh marker will not fade, you know, and they last for a few years. And then um, the ruler and the spoon and the rubber band, I will explain in a minute. Okay, this is a cat litter container. So this is another optional jug that you can use. This container is big enough that I can put two different varieties of seeds in it and it works really well. So I'm gonna show you a picture of that in a minute, in a little bit. Uh, but there's lots of other choices. Food containers galore. You can use anything that you want. My best piece of advice though, is if you are planting native plants or perennials, my best piece of advice is to make sure that that container can fit four inches of soil. Now these little pint, I think those are pint like soup containers. Those are pretty shallow. And I think they would be okay for anything that you are going to start and transplant very, very quickly, very early. So things like lettuce and other little greens and things like that, because uh, there's not a lot of headspace in there, but they do work. So you, there's, there's so much choice. So a couple of other things that you can use. What do you do with those vinyl blanket containers? I never know what to do with these things, but I never want to get rid of them because they just seem like a product that should be reused. This is a really great method to reuse these guys. So this person, um, Andrea Clark, she's on the Facebook page. She gave me permission to use her photograph. So she built a wooden frame that this blanket storage container goes into. It's all vinyl, which is a really good product to use to go over the soil um, to protect the plants. And Trudy uses sheets of vinyl over some of her trays in her garden and it works really well for her. So vinyl is a perfectly appropriate product for this, but it's great that she's reusing this uh, blanket uh, container. So, and then she just closes up and zips it and her plants can grow. Uh, the only thing, I wonder if Andrea has any drainage holes like cut in the bottom. I don't see any, but um, I'm sure there's somewhere for the water to grow in there to go. Because when she waters, you got to have uh, you have to have a vent out the top and you have to have uh, drainage in the bottom. Another thing that a lot of people are starting to use are Ziploc type bags and um, hefty bags, the ones that zip on the top, especially the, the ones that work really well are the ones that have the wide bottom that um, are pleated. And so they open up a little bit more and you can put some soil in. And obviously it works because this gardener had really good success. I'm not sure who took this photograph. There's a few of my pictures in here that are not credited. So forgive me for not having credit on them. Um, two liter bottles work, flat lettuce containers work. Again, there's not a lot of headspace in there, but if it's a plant that you know you're gonna transplant early, um, then you can go ahead and use them. I don't want you to think that the only thing in the world you can use is a one gallon jug. 
because there is more to use. You can see there's a, a one gallon apple cider jug in the back. And then of course the two liter bottles. One liter bottles are a little bit small. They don't hold quite enough soil in there if you're going to plant something with big roots like a native plant. Uh, but you can certainly plant some herbs in it, you know, some kind of small herb like sage or thyme or basil, cilantro, something with shorter roots. Okay, so here's the list of the materials that you'll need. This list is also in your handout that you got from me. As far as the tape goes, you can use the poly tape. You can use duct tape. I have seen people use masking tape. I'm not sure how it performs the whole winter through, but obviously it stuck. So they used it. And you know what? Sometimes you just got to use what you have in the house because that's what you have to use. So just use what you have around the house first before you really go out and start buying a lot of things for this method because that's, that's kind of the whole other idea of this is recycling, using what you have around your house, using simple things. Don't make it very complicated and it doesn't have to be expensive. Okay. All right, let's talk about potting soil. This is probably the number two question that comes up on the Facebook page a lot. And um, I think some gardeners kind of overthink it. They get really worried about what type of potting soil that they're gonna use and you really don't need to. Um, potting soil, the, the one thing is, is that you really should use potting soil rather than topsoil or garden soil or something else like that because topsoil, black soil, black dirt, garden soil, those are all so dense that once, when you put them into a container, whether it be a flower pot, a big planter, or something small like a, a container that you're going to winter sow in, it compresses the water that is put on it to make the soil wet for things to grow in it will compress it so much that the roots cannot grow into it. So it's not appropriate to put topsoil and black soil and things like that into a container. Potting soil has other things in it like sphagnum peat and um, tree bark bits, pine bark bits. Um, it can have perlite, it can have vermi vermiculite, it can have core, which is coconut core, which is uh, coconut fiber. All of those things either help retain a little bit of moisture or help water drain away. And the combination of those two things makes really good potting soil. So potting soil is not potting soil. People are going to really love one brand over another, but here's a couple of things that I avoid. Um, I avoid all garden soil and black soil. Um, I've used a lot of different kinds of soil, but I avoid any kind of potting soil that is made from black soil. There's one brand out there. I don't really want to bash any brands, but there are, there's one or two brands out there that are made, uh, potting soil made from black soil, and they're just a little bit too thick. They're just a little too heavy in my experience. Um, I avoid Let's see, seed starting mix I avoid because it's too light. It's also extremely expensive and I would go broke if I was going to use seed starting mix for 150 containers or whatever I might end up doing in a year. So I avoid the seed starting mix. It just doesn't retain enough moisture. Now, if you're starting seeds in the house, seed starting mix is definitely preferred, definitely. Um, I avoid fertilizer in my potting soil for this uh, part of the process of growing just because it, it is a waste of product. It's going to be released from its little slow release pellets. It's going to be sitting in the soil and the only thing it might grow is algae, at least in my experience it has. So what this, all the fertilizer, all the food, all the nutrients that the seedling needs is in the seed until the second set of leaves comes out. So you really don't have to have fertilizer until later. However, if the only kind of potting soil that you have available to you is the kind that has fertilizer in it, or it's the only bag of so soil that you have at the house left over from last summer, then just use it. Go ahead and use it. It's not going to hurt anything. It's not going to hurt your seedlings. Um, the worst thing, you might get a little bit of algae in there, and that can be scraped out. Um, I avoid the soil that has water-holding polymers in it because of where I live. 
Now I learned this from Trudy that there are certain places around the United States and in other parts of the world that might actually need those water holding polymers in the potting soil in the jugs. And that could be Arizona, New Mexico, Southern California, places where it's really, really dry and hot, even in the, even in the winter. So keep that in mind that um, you don't want water holding polymers in this area because your soil could just retain too much moisture and get soggy and some of your seeds might rot. But in other parts of the country where it's drier, you're, you might need it. And then I don't use last year's potting soil that I have had in planters um, or sitting in a bin that was used in years past. I'm not gonna use that for the uh, winter sowing, mostly because there most definitely is algae spores in there. And I have had algae disasters in my jugs in the past. And so I just prefer not to use it. If you have reused potting soil in the past and had a good experience with it, God bless you. But I have not had a good experience with it. So I'm not gonna do that anymore. Um, but yeah, like I said, for the most part, any potting soil is going to do as long as it's nice and light and fluffy and drains well. If you open up a bag of soil and you say, hmm, this brand is a little bit too, it's got too much sphagnum peat in it. It's too, um, too fluffy but it's sphagnum peat that can hold a lot of moisture and you got to think about it like there's not enough white bits in there so add some perlite to your soil if you want to. Perlite is pretty easy, um, it's pretty easy to get and um, I just want to make sure that I've covered all my notes here on this slide. Okay yeah that's it. So basically you want to avoid algae, you don't want things to dry out too fast, you don't want things to stay wet too much, and you don't necessarily need fertilizer right away. Okay, one important reminder is that when you are winter sowing, um, not all of your seeds might germinate by middle of May when you're ready to plant. And so just keep that in the back of your mind that it, it doesn't necessarily mean that that jug is a, dead, a dud, it just might mean that those seeds haven't germinated yet. There are a couple of varieties, like uh, a couple of species like columbine and uh, common milkweed specifically, those two can be very stubborn at times, um, especially if your seed might be just slightly old. Doesn't mean those seeds are dead, it just might mean that those seeds are a little old and they need a little bit of extra time in order to germinate. And so once you get to mid-May and you say, oh my goodness, these guys, they didn't germinate. Just open up the container, take the top off, make sure there's a tag in there so you know what seeds are in the containers and then start watering that as you would a small seed tray of uh, seeds and keep it out in the sun, you know, keep it in a good spot where um, they have access to the sunlight and they can maybe germinate. And you, you might get lucky, they might germinate. Remember I said that there were four jugs last winter, last spring that I had that didn't germinate. And then I opened them all up and three did and then one didn't, so. And the one that didn't germinate was very strange because it was um, Queen of the Prairie, which is a native plant. And I had two jugs of Queen of the Prairie, one germinated and one didn't. So it was very strange. There is a possibility that I forgot the seeds in the jug and just taped it up without the seeds. So there is that possibility. Things like that do happen when you're doing 100 jugs every year. All right, uh, so just keep in mind that plants do, some plants just take longer than others and try not to be disappointed. Don't be disappointed in yourself as a gardener. You're not a failure. Um, I do silly things like forget seeds in the jugs every once in a while. And, you know, sometimes they just take longer. All right, so let's go over the steps. First of all, if your container, whatever it is, a, a milk jug or um, a food container of any type, uh, if it has had anything in it that uh, can potentially go bad, rancid, smell bad, uh, make sure that you wash it thoroughly with hot water. Dawn works really well. If what you have had in there was really, really stinky, then a couple of drops of bleach won't hurt. Um, you don't have to sterilize these containers. They just have to be clean. And then I think it's beneficial just to let them air dry for a day or so before you start cutting into them. Just uh, mostly because I'm doing this on my living room floor. 
because that's the best place that I have in the winter to do this. And I don't necessarily want to spill water everywhere on the floor in my living room. So, um, so I just let them dry out for a day. Then the, the next thing that you're going to do is make the drainage holes. Do not cut your jugs open to use them without putting the drainage holes in because you need the jug intact. Let me put it to you this way. The jug is stronger and easier to cut into in the bottom if the whole jug is intact. If you try to put the drainage holes in using a, like a little paring knife like I am here, after you have cut the whole thing around, then it's gonna be a lot weaker and um, it's flimsier and it's gonna be really hard to do it. So the thing that I use to make my drainage holes is just a paring knife and I make a V cut. You can see that sort of on the top and the center. And sometimes if I get lucky, if I do it in the right spot, I can just stick my paring knife in and twist it around a few times and make a circular hole. The holes don't have to be circular. The V cut is just fine. It's gonna make a little bit of a tab and I push that tab into the container and uh, just to make sure I don't cut my finger on it later. So, but you can also snip them off with the scissors. Um, I usually only have four holes in the bottom of my jugs. That usually seems to be sufficient. Um, other gardeners do it different ways and that's okay. That's not a problem. This gardener had a genius idea to drill or to maybe they used a nail and just popped it through the bottom of the jugs, which is cool too. You can do that. But putting it in the milk jug, uh, the milk crates is genius because that keeps them stable and you can work with them that way. You can work with four at a time. So I thought that was pretty cool. I, this is an uncredited photo. I apologize if this is your photo and I did not ask permission. It popped up somewhere on my Facebook and I just grabbed it. Um, if it's your photo, let me know. Mm -hmm. uh, measure and cut then. So the reason why I have the rubber band in the previous photo is because you use that so this is, let me preface this. This is usually what you do for the first and second year of winter sowing, just, to, just until you get familiar how much soil you need in your containers and where to cut to get that four inches. And for a milk jug, you're gonna cut right under the handle, right next to the handle. That's about four inches below there. But the rubber band, just putting that giant rubber band around there and drawing the line really helps you to cut uh, a straight line so that when you get to the other end, you have a hinge and everything is level, everything is the same height. And when you open it, it's, um, it's all even, you know, for lack of a better word. So when you go to cut the top, you simply stick a knife in and make a cut uh, a couple of inches long with your paring knife or utility knife or whatever. And then I take utility scissors and the utility scissors take over and I cut all the way around the other way. You do not cut the base of the handle of the milk jug so that it, so the uh, top stays attached. It's much easier to tape up when you have it attached. So leave it attached. If you happen to mistakenly cut it off, it's no big deal. It's just gonna be a little bit harder to tape up just, I would not make a habit of it because it does take extra time to tape it if you don't have them attached, okay? This is an alternative method that I've tried a couple times that I, I like uh, in a pinch or if I'm running out of tape. This is a great method if you're running out of tape. So you just basically measure your four inches. You um, make a half circle type of shape uh, and you cut out a window and that window can fold down or your window can fold up. It doesn't matter. Whatever way you want to do it, it is slightly trickier to get the soil in and the seeds and to work inside your jug. But if you're running out of soil or if you're, sorry, if you're running out of tape and you need to get these things done, then this is a good alternative to save you on that. Works pretty good. All right. Uh, another tip that I think will help you a lot. If you're, if you have slugs in your area, oh God, I have slugs in my garden and I hate them. Um, so I started putting a coffee filter in the bottom of my jugs. Uh, I learned that from someone somewhere and uh, that sort of keeps the soil in the jugs because my holes, obviously my holes are a little bit bigger because I make those V cuts, keeps the soil in the jugs 
And then it also keeps slugs from climbing in and eating your seedlings, which is a big problem for some people. Um, they just climb right up the inside of the jug and they crawl over onto the soil and they can eat all of your seedlings in one jug in a day. So my containers go on my deck, but some of my containers go on my patio. And when your containers go on the ground, they're a little bit more at risk uh, they're a little bit more easily available to the slugs. And for whatever reason, the coffee filter keeps them out. It's, it's just enough of a barrier that they can't get in, okay? But if you do not have slugs, you do not have to use a coffee filter. Okay, after you get your container uh, drainage holes done, you cut your container open, you're gonna fill your container with soil, and then, um, and it usually takes about eight cups of soil, seven to eight cups of potting soil for your container. And then what I do, this is gonna look really weird, but what I do is that I put my fingers in the soil to kind of get the air out of it and tamp it down a little bit. I, I don't push the soil down. You never wanna do that because roots won't be able to grow through that compressed potting soil. But I put my fingers in just to get some of that extra air out. And then I put another small layer of soil in. Now, the reason why I do this is because if you are going to, if your soil is very dry or even just a little bit more on the dry side, you're gonna put your seeds in there. You're going to water your jugs and then you're gonna, you know, uh, tape them up and put them outside and kind of forget about them for a little while. If there's too much air in that potting soil and if the potting soil is too dry, it's going to compress as it as it goes, you know, as it goes outside. The more moisture it gets in there, it's going to compress and compress and compress. And I've seen some jugs that people have made, you know, where they end up with like an inch or an inch and a half of soil in the bottom. Nothing can grow in an inch and a half soil for um, two to four months. So you need that four inches of soil, and that's a good way to uh, fix it, so that you make sure that you have enough. Okay. So make sure, but do make sure your soil is pretty moist when you put it in there because that really helps mitigate that problem off the top. And then um, add a plant label on the inside of your jug. It's really important because, at least for me, because what I do is I write the name of the plant on the top of the jug so that I can see it when I look down. And um, when I go to cut the tops of those jugs off, there goes the name with the top of the jug. So having a tag inside is very important. Some people label in different ways too. They use a numbering system, things like that, and that's fine. After you add your seeds in there and make sure you have your tag inside, uh, mm -hmm. then you can tape up. So if you're using the poly tape, my suggestion would be to cut two shorter pieces of tape instead of one that goes all the way around. And, and this helps with the duct tape also. Um, cut two shorter ones, and overlap them. It's a little bit easier to handle. It's a little bit easier to maneuver um, instead of one, you know, piece of tape that's like almost 18 inches long. So a milk jug is wider than you think it is. Okay, so how many seeds is too many in a jug? That's, that's another really common question. In this photo, we have hollyhock seeds, and this is probably too many. This is definitely too many hollyhock seeds. If you've ever seen hollyhock seedlings, they can be very large. So this is probably too much, um, but this was my jug a couple of years ago and I intended on taking those hollyhocks out very early. It was actually the first jug that I transplanted in the spring and uh, into pots for planting out in the parks. So you can overcrowd your jugs with seedlings as long as that's what you plan on doing. You're transplanting early, you're putting them into pots, even if you're putting them into the ground. If you're planning on doing that transplanting pretty quick, then go ahead and do it. But if you are also like me and your plants sit in your jugs throughout the entire summer because you work full time and you don't have time to put them in the ground, then you, you have to kind of plan accordingly and make sure that your seedlings are gonna have enough soil to sustain them for that amount of time. Um, each one of these hollyhock seedlings can have a pretty extensive and large root system, and you want to make sure there's enough room in there for those roots. Um, okay. 
another couple of things about seeds is um, this picture on the left are sunflower seeds. And these sunflower seeds, I am not sure who gave them to me, but they were a gift from someone and they weren't labeled with any kind of marking or anything. And they're really pretty big sunflower. And the seeds were absolutely gigantic. They were about as big as a pumpkin seed. And I've never seen a sunflower seed that big before. So what I did when I sowed these was I put them on their side, just as I would a squash seed, a cucumber seed, melon seed, or a pumpkin seed. Those seeds are so large that, um, in conventional gardening and um, sowing indoors, sowing in a greenhouse, putting them in the ground, those kind of seeds rot very fast when they get too wet and then they don't germinate. And so to prevent that and to kind of stave off that happening, you put them on their side, you stand them up on their side, it works pretty well. And I had all of these seeds germinate and I, in fact, I planted these really late. I planted these in April last year. I think like the second week of April, because I had just come across the seeds. I thought, oh, let's just give it a chance. And they did germinate and they grew very nicely. So, um, but this is just a way to plant very, very large seeds like those squash family seeds, cucurbit seeds, to keep them from rotting while they're in the soil. These other seeds next to them uh, are one of my favorite looking seeds. I think they just look so cool. They look like a badminton. Um, shuttlecock and this is a scabiosa called star flower. It's a really beautiful flower. It's just starting to come on the market now so you'll start seeing it more and more in the future. There's no color to it. It's just like translucent orb of, of flowers. It's so hard to explain but these are the seeds and that little shuttlecock part is attached to the seeds so don't try and cut it off or pull it off if you do grow these. But these are so big, I spaced them out because I knew that if this is a big seed, this was going to be a bigger seedling and I didn't want them to be completely overcrowded. So, you know, bigger seeds, maybe space them out. Here's that jug of zinnia in the cat litter jug where I put half uh, zinnia oriole and the other half was zinnia cherry red, which I think the cherry red magenta, that was a seed that I collected. And then the other one is a package of seeds that I bought. And the collected seed is, is sort of towards the bottom. And then the, the seeds on the top are the ones from uh, the seed company. They look, they both look really good, don't they? The collected seed that I um, had collected uh, really was beautiful, big seeds. I was very, very happy with it. And then I simply covered them with a, a very shallow layer a small layer, a quarter inch or so of potting soil and just tamped it down, um, probably with my water bottle and um, closed it up. And as long as you have the labeling done well on both sides and in the center, then combining two different types of seed in a container is okay. But I really think that something large like a big aluminum pan, you can do this in, you can do this in something like the cat litter containers, but to do it in something small like a food container or a milk jug is just a little bit too small because if you have two different seedlings and they grow at different heights and different rates, one is going to shade the other out and you might not get the other, um, the other seed might not be successful. So just kind of keep that in mind. You don't want one to crowd the other out. So after closing your jug um, with the tape, whether it be you know, masking tape, uh, frog tape, poly tape, whatever you use, um, duct tape, this is white duct tape here. Uh, make sure that you label the outside of your jug now. So sometimes I write on the duct tape and sometimes I write on the top of the container and uh, somewhere on the top of the container, I will put the date that it was planted. And then that way when I uh, look in there and I see when it has germinated. It kind of gives me a little bit of a clue as to how long it took for this plant to grow. How long did it germinate? How long did it have to be in the cold? It's just sort of, it's just my nomenclature, nomenclature that I use. You certainly do not have to put the date that you planted it on your containers unless that's something that you want to follow, the germination and the planting date. All right, labeling containers. Let's talk about that a little bit. 
So you can use a lot of different things for labeling inside and outside. Plastic plant markers, again, plastic knives. I've used plastic spoons in the past because I had a box of them laying around and I needed something to label my containers. So one year it was all plastic spoons. You just write in the bowl of the spoon what the plant name is. Uh, you can use duct tape on the bottom of your containers. It kind of a strip in between your drainage holes. Make sure it's in between your drainage holes so that it doesn't get wet and um, come off. But if you use the duct tape on the bottom of the container, then you can use regular Sharpie. You don't have to use a UV resistant marker, so you can kind of get away with not using the UV resistant in that, ca in that case. Um, or you can use a UV resistant marker and write on the top like I did. You can use a paint marker, you can use a China pencil. Um, I've seen all different kinds of methods of people doing it. Um, someone was saying on the Facebook page the other day that they used nail polish. Sure, why not? If you had nail polish in the house, go for it. Because you know what? It's UV resistant and it is waterproof. All right, so this is why labeling your containers is so important. Because if you have a hundred containers and you put them all out on your patio, um, your backyard or on your deck, you have to be able to tell what's in there. This is my patio last year, uh, or two years ago actually, and this was after I opened them all up. And once I really opened them all up and cut all the tops of those milk jugs off, there better be a label inside because if there isn't a label inside and I'm just cutting really quickly and all of those things go into a big pile to go into the, comp to go into the recycling bin, then I'm kind of lost. And so then that's where that skill of being able to identify seedlings comes in very important. I can, I can identify most of the seedlings of the things that I grow, and that's just because I've been growing them over and over, and so I just, I'm familiar with them. So it, it'd be, it would be a good idea to start getting familiar with those kinds of details. Um, after you tape everything up and label and you're ready to go, put your, put your uh, jugs outside. This is my deck. Um, that blue container there is my cat's outdoor house. Um, so he gets preferential treatment there. And then uh, don't worry about your jugs getting snowed on because that's sort of the whole point. So that, that was my containers last year. They totally got snowed on. The cat's house got moved. So the cat's house did not get snowed on. The cat's house at that point was somewhere else where it was drier. Uh, but that, that's kind of the whole point. You don't have to brush the snow off. You don't have to worry about it. Whatever snow is on the top over the, over the opening um, or the vent holes on whatever container that you're using, it's just going to melt and go inside and water your plants and, and your seeds, and that's what you want. All right, another way to do this uh, is to use crates. These are bulb crates uh, from the horticulture industry. I, fortunately, I had access to these through my job. So these are great because I can fit seven containers in here, seven jugs, and sometimes eight if I use uh, a certain kind of jug, those white, those clear jugs, I can get eight, just, yeah, eight. And um, it's great because I have to move these things around all the time at home. It just seems like once spring comes, I'm shuffling them around a lot. And so it's just very helpful. But milk, milk crates work too, if you have milk crates. So let's talk about watering, which I think is one of the other questions that comes up quite frequently. Or at least what I hear from other gardeners is that when they are not successful in winter sowing and they feel really down about it and they're really bummed out and they're wondering whether or not they should try again, my first question to them always is, did you water your jugs at all? Because if you didn't, then that could be why you didn't have as good success as you expected because that's what happened to me in my first year. So the way a seed works is that a seed, um, let's talk about natives for a second. Those native seeds live outside in the prairie, in the forests, in the wetlands, and they are cold for the whole winter. But you know what else they need? They need moisture. They need snow cover, and that snow cover needs to melt and keep the seeds and the soil moist over the winter. Not wet, but moist. So that's why watering the containers is pretty important. Um, when the soil completely dries out, then that, that seed could completely die if it gets really hot in there. 
Um, and sometimes it does get really hot inside those jugs. You know, you can kind of stick your fingers in there. This winter, I'm going to monitor the temperature inside some of the jugs just, just kind of for fun. Out of my own curiosity, I want to satisfy that curiosity. So I bought a new thermometer gun for my grill, you know, that kind of thermometer. And I'm going to use that and just kind of point that laser inside the jugs on a sunny day and see how cold they are or how warm they are. So I'm, I'm very interested in finding that out. So for watering, um, what I usually do is I water, I, I will check my jugs and make sure they need water when it is 35 and over out and when it's very sunny out. And in this area, that happens frequently in the Chicagoland area in the Midwest. We're kind of on a temperature roller coaster for, throughout the winter. We have a lot of freeze and thaw periods. And your containers um, should be checked when it's really, really sunny outside. The snow has melted. Um, if they feel very, very light, like you could throw them into the next county, then they definitely need water. But if they have condensation in them, like in this photograph, then um, they don't probably need a lot of water. They could probably use a little bit of water, but not a lot. So, um, but again, your containers don't need to be swampy. They need to be moist, um, but not soaking wet and uh, water when your sides of your jugs turn dry or inside whatever container you use, it doesn't matter. And then you're gonna water with a spray bottle. And I'm gonna show you how to do that. Um, so watering for containers and for small seedlings needs to be very gentle at first. And that's why this method that I'm gonna show you here in a second is really great. So a water bottle is perfect for this. Um, the, a spout that matches the one inch uh, hole that a, a gallon of water or a gallon or a milk jug or a gallon, a water gallon has <laughs> will work really wow. well. So a water bottle will fit right into it. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, you can use a small nail or a very sharp, large needle to make the holes in the cap of your water bottle. And you can do this by heating uh, the tip of your, um, I use a needle. So you heat the tip of the needle just in a candle flame and then push it through the cap of the bottle. And you make about 25 holes in the center. And you want to keep the holes in the center because they spray better when they're all kind of clustered in the center. Um, it's real gentle. The smaller the holes, kind of the better they are at spraying gently. And um, and I don't know, it, it just works really, really well. For a while there, for the first year, I used a spray bottle. I don't know, I have arthritis in my hands and that spray bottle killed my hands. And I had, you know, if you have 100 or 150 jugs, if you're really doing a big project, then using a little spray bottle is going to be very difficult on your hands. So this is why I'm encouraging, you know, using the water bottle. You have to squeeze the water bottle, but it doesn't require quite as much pressure if you have pain in your hands or your fingers. So I think it works better. Um, super easy to make, takes minutes. I think it's just collecting the, the one liter water bottles that can be kind of a pain in the butt. Um, I have a collection now of like a dozen of them that I've just kept over the years. And um, each one liter bottle will water two milk jugs or two one gallon jugs. So that'll help you gauge how many you think you need or how many times you need to refill them. All right, so, so now your jugs are outside. You have your water bottles handy for when you need them. Um, they're getting sun. What are you going to expect in the next few weeks? Your germination is gonna be different for every plant and cold hardy plants are gonna germinate first. And for us in this area, in the Chicagoland area, uh, zone 5B, that's gonna be about the, the last week of March is when they're gonna start germinating. And then things really blow up in April. It's really fun to watch everything germinate in April. Um, they're gonna germinate just as winter is transitioning into spring. So that means longer days, more light, the days are warming up, the overnight temperatures are still freezing or still very cold, and that's, and that's okay. That just means that your seedlings are going to be hardened off very well. So again, days are cool, but they're warming up. Nights are still freezing. Seeds are going to germinate. This is the seedling of that star flower, that Scabiosa star flower. 
I encourage you to look up that flower. It's very, very cool. If you like straw flowers, if you're really into those kind of flowers, you're going to love that one. Um, open your jugs beginning in late April. And then a few weeks after that, this is jug opening day, which is usually mid-May in my house. And um, I'll bring the recycling bins out. I bring my little footstool out. I sit out there, have a drink, um, pull all the tape off. I usually have to cut through the duct tape instead of pulling it completely off, which is hard for um, recycling because then I have to take it off again. So if you can get the duct tape off all at once, God bless you, because it's really hard for me to do that. Um, but I do try and get off so that I can recycle. Always have a garden buddy. That's my buddy, Ginger George. All right, so this is why I advise you not to plant more than one variety in a, in a milk jug or a small container um, because seedlings come in all different shapes and sizes. And if I was to put a few of these into one small container like a one gallon jug together, one would definitely eat the other. Like it would just shade out the seeds of the other one and um, the smaller one wouldn't grow very well. So I just want you to keep that in mind because it is a common question. Uh, watch out for watering. You can, at this point when the jugs are completely open, you can see, this was from two years ago, you can see that a lot of my jugs at this point in May had not germinated very well, but once it kind of stopped raining every day and it got warmer, things really did start to germinate much better. Um, I think this was the year that I lost almost all my zinnias in the late April snowstorm um, and 20 degree temperatures. So those guys didn't recover very well, but in 2021, um, I did cover all my containers just right. And it was just, just, you know, barely not too cold. And so the, the zinnias all turned yellow, but then they all grew. So I was really lucky this year. So every year in gardening is different. You know that there's only one constant in horticulture and that's, it depends. And it depends every year and everything is different every year. So you got to kind of gauge that and get to know that. Keep that in your mind, believe it wholeheartedly that it's going to be different every year. And you will not be as disappointed as you were in the past if you have been a disappointed gardener. The most important thing about this photo that I want to tell you is that um, torrential rains can be really bad for your seedlings. So I had all of my uh, containers up here on my deck. Unfortunately, when I had my deck made, uh, the decking was put close together so where it was butted up against each other and touching because that's what I told Mike Carpenter to do when he asked me what I wanted. And unfortunately, it holds water. So. I had to elevate everything onto trays during this terrible, terrible rainstorm in um, May of 2020. And it really, oh man, that was a bad day. That was a really bad rainstorm. Um, let's see. Uh, going back to too many seedlings in a container, the jug at the top hand right is Verbena Hestata, and that jug has too many seeds in it. Here is a good example of too many seeds. Um, the ones that are down towards the bottom of what looks like the bottom of the jug to you in the front uh, didn't get used. None of those seedlings got used because they weren't able to develop well enough. They, you know, the jug was turned in a certain way, didn't get enough light on that side of the jug. They didn't germinate until after the other ones germinated. And then they couldn't grow because they didn't have enough room because the roots on the other ones just grew all the way across and um, just basically ate all the soil. So that is um, a very, very good example of too many seedlings. The Joe Pye weed also down on the bottom left, those needed to be, germ those needed to be separated and transplanted very, very fast because they were so crowded. So just kind of gauge, you know, how many plants do I really need? What am I using these plants for? Uh, how many do I really need? Save a little bit of seed for the next year. Your seeds will still be good if you, if you store them properly. Um, another little word about fertilizer very quickly. Uh, again, your seeds have everything that they need inside the seed until they grow to their second set of uh, mature leaves. And when your seeds get transplanted, whether they be into a pot, a planter, or the ground, that's when they can benefit from a little bit of, of um, 
fertilizer. And this can be in the, the shape of slow release fertilizer pellets, or you can use organic fertilizer too. A liquid organic fertilizer is really good or granular. Um, but any liquid for fertilizer formula that you use when you first transplant your plants, that liquid fertilizer should be half strength. Not full strength, not 120% strength, half strength, 50% strength, because it's much more gentle on the roots of your plants and it won't burn them and it actually will help them grow. You don't wanna burn your plants right when you put them in the ground. So let's talk about transplanting seedlings really quickly. This, um, there's a couple of different methods of transplanting. Trudy always talks about the hunk of seedlings uh, transplanting method, which I absolutely love. Uh, it works really well. And all you have to do is basically, if I was gonna take out these seedlings from this jug, which is chrysanthemum seedlings, I think. And if I was gonna take them out, I would just take them out and separate it into three, three sections and I'd plant them. That's hunk of seedlings. It's super easy. You don't have to think it, overthink it too much. Just get them in the ground. Um, if it's a really, really densely populate, populated jug of seedlings, you put them in the ground after you divide them up and you know you make as many little hunks as you need in your garden and then you can thin them out a little bit just by snipping off the tops of some of the seedlings just so they don't get overcrowded. These were common milkweed seeds that actually grew in a flower pot. I threw a common milkweed seed pod in a flower pot and it just overwintered outside and they came out looking like this. There was like 150 of them in this, this one 12 inch pot. And I transplanted those up pretty quickly, separated them out because they were so dense. Here I separated out the seedlings because they were so big into two per pot. And I sold those at my plant sale. So you can do a lot of different ways. This is another method. Um, these were, I think, thyme seedlings. These, this is thyme seedlings. And here is where I would use the brownie method, where you're just gonna take those seedlings out. You can see the seedlings in the bottom left-hand corner. They are the same shape as the jug that they came out of. And all I did was you, you can tear little hunks of seedlings out or you can cut them with a knife and just cut them into small sections. I am not sure what these seedlings are, but this looks to me like um, this is someone growing microgreens. Um, I'm almost 100% sure of that. And if you have a tray like this of perennials or tomatoes or something like that, you're in big trouble because it's going to take a lot of time to separate them out and transplant them uh, properly. Now, if this is a tray of microgreens, what you're going to do is you're going to cut the top off and eat the tops and you're going to compost the bottoms because they will not regrow. Um, this is a little bit overpopulated if this is going to be vegetables for a garden. But again, it's just an example of how you can take really dense um, population of seedlings. You can cut them up into little sections and pot them up or plant them however you need to. It, it's not brain surgery. It's not rocket science. It, it really is just simple. Tear them apart. The roots can take it. If you're gentle and you let me caution you with this. When you do go to transplant your plants out of your jugs, probably the most important thing to think about is to water them before you, before you take them out and start cutting into them and tearing them apart and planting them because they'll come apart 100% easier than if the tray, was, tray or container was dry. So I'd say that that's more important than thinking about um, what, you know, how many seedlings I'm gonna have in each little hunk you know, what shape am I going to cut them into? Where am I going to put them? You know, is, is this going to be too many in this hunk? You know, don't overthink it, but do remember to water them because that's pretty important. Now, again, the seedlings can go into pots or into the ground. This was for a plant sale for me at work. No, this was at home. This is my house. This was last summer. Um, so these were my swamp milkweed seedlings that I sold. As soon as I put these things into these pots of um, soil, you can see that there's little yellow pellets of Osmocote in there. That's my favorite fertilizer. And then um, I did give them a little bit of a root booster, um, a very, very diluted root booster after that. And they really perked up very well. So that brings us to spring sowing. Your winter sowing is planted. It's, 
it's taken care of, it's done, but you forgot to plant something. Oh my goodness, you wanted something and you wanted purple cone flowers this year. Have to have them this year? Well, you're gonna plant them in the fall if you're gonna spring sow. So um, after you have gotten all that winter sowing done, you can spring sow by just mostly, the only difference is, is it's gonna require a little bit more water, a slightly bit more shade for your plants in the jugs, and then vents at the top. You can see where I have the two red circles in the photograph there. Those are around the vents that I highlighted with the black marker that I cut into that jug. And that just releases more hot air that is going to accumulate because the temperatures outdoors are, is warmer. And that's really the only difference. This is actually a very useful method of starting seeds in spring and summer for fall planting in, in respects to keeping uh, squirrels, mice, rabbits out of your seedlings. So it's a really nice protected way to do it. So I hope that helps. Uh, the extra vents are important. Um, in this jug, I think I cut four of them around the top, but you know, cut four or five, just um, so that hot air can get out. All right, now what happens if you don't plant? Yes, these are my jugs. Yes, I'm a very lazy gardener. Yes, I work full time. Well, not anymore, but I did. So these are my jugs that overwintered um, from the winter of 2020. Yeah, they were in these jugs for two winters before I planted them this year. So what I did was I took these um, jugs and they're, they're like on top of my other big planters. And that's where they overwintered, where they sort of had soil underneath them, kind of insulate them a little bit. Most of these plants, 90% of these plants in these jugs are all natives. And so they grew absolutely beautifully and they were three-year-old plants and I put them in the ground and they grew. So these um, did very well for me. I was very happy with it. So just put them, if you have jugs at the end of the season, you can take the contents of the jug out. You can put it into a bigger container in August. If, you, if, you, if it's like August and you say, oh my God, I need to do something with these. You can just take them out. Don't disturb the roots. Just put them into a bigger container to insulate them and you can just leave them on your patio or put them in your garage for the winter. But these I simply left on my patio. My patio kind of is a little microclimate. It's really protected. I'm very lucky to have it. And um, they were just sort of exposed like this, sitting on top of other planters, and they survived. So they can survive. And I would say that you have a better chance of things surviving over winter um, if it is uh, native, because they are such tough plants. So just a few photos before we wrap up of things that I have winter sown in my garden. Um, on the left hand photograph, we have red zinnias. I have no idea what variety of red zinnias, just big red, probably binary giant. Um, and then that the skinny flower next to it, that little slim flower is Spanish flag vine, which is in the family of morning glory. However, it is not as much of a pest as morning glory and hummingbirds really love this plant. So that's why I grow it. And then in the center is a new variety of basil that came out that grows uh, like 28 to 36 inches tall. It's called Emerald Towers. And I was absolutely stunned at how beautiful that plant was. It did not even try to bloom until the end of August, which was excellent. I got three cuttings off of it. It was just beautiful because, you know, once basil starts to bloom and form, form buds and bloom, then it kind of turns bitter. And so this one, the blooming is way at the end of the season. And you can, because this, the plants grow so tall, you can collect off of it even longer for um, eating, trying, um, and making pesto. And then the, um, the next one over is painted tongue. It's called salpoglossus. And the variety was named Dolly. Anytime I come across a variety of something named Dolly, I try it. I was not impressed with Dolly basil but the salps of glasses I was. Uh, globe thistle is a great plant, beautiful bee plant, big pollinator plant. Purple coneflower grows for me every year very well. Um, another great pollinator plant, perennial lupin. These are winter, these were all winter sown, but these perennial lupin I got from another gardener from the winter sowers group. Um, so I'm, I don't remember your name right now, but if you're on here, thank you very much. 
Uh, another great native plant, golden ragwort for the Midwest. It likes moist soil. This was winter sown and then put into a pot and then the pot of the golden ragwort lived in my garden in a pot for three winters. So talk about neglect. That plant is tough. It finally got in the ground last year. It's a beautiful plant. It's a great ground cover for a moist area and a slight uh, like half shade. Um, and I just love the flowers so much in the spring. It's a really beautiful pop of yellow. Yellow foxglove, that's Digitalis lutea. I've uh, grown this one for many years. Um, actually, that might not be lutea. That might be the other perennial foxglove. So these are perennial foxgloves, these yellow ones that I grow. Um, they are short-lived perennial for sure, like four to five years or three to five years, but, um, but they are perennial instead of being biennials. So they will bloom the first year, which I was impressed with. And then Gloriosa daisy, which is generally an annual, but in my garden for some reason over last winter it lived. I was happy about that. Yellow cornflower, which is, uh, which is one of the big showy plants in my garden. Um, it's not a native, but it is a plant that bumblebees absolutely adore. So that's why I grow it. Um, they really, really love it, but be prepared. It is a very large plant, very large. That plant is four foot tall and if it's four foot wide if it's an inch. And there's like three of them in there. So it's really big. So you gotta have a spot for it and it has to be full sun. Butterfly weed, uh, Winter sows for me beautifully. Showy goldenrod is beautiful. It's the, and showy goldenrod is a great, well-behaved goldenrod. This is my mess of garden. This is just one of my beds. This is what I call the West Garden. On the left side next to the house are all my pots. So it makes it absolutely impossible to walk down there except to water during the summer, which is kind of fun. Nobody gets to go down there except me. I grew birdhouse gourds and loofah sponge gourds uh, last summer for the very first time. I winter sowed the vines and just kind of threw them in the ground in my backyard um, next to my fence and they grew beautifully. And I got five of these absolutely giant birdhouse gourds. And then um, a lot of other small ones. I got lots of loofah sponges, but they were planted too late and they came on too late. And I got this one in this photo to dry properly. So out of like 45 loofahs, I got one. Uh, so next year, I've learned my lesson next year, they have to go in the ground a lot earlier. So what does not winter sow? Winter sowing is just for seeds. So what we don't wanna do is put anything that is tender into a jug, anything that is fleshy into a jug, because both of those things are gonna die and they're gonna rot. So tulips will rot. Um, tulips need to be down in the ground. Uh, six to 10 inches and sometimes even 12 inches because they need insulation and they need to be kind of close to that frost line below. Uh, daffodils, same deal. They're too fleshy. They will die in a, a jug because they're, it'll be too wet and they'll just dry. They're, sorry, they'll rot. And um, dahlias, the same deal. Those are tender. They're tropical plants. They can't be outside in the winter at all in the ground. And so above ground wouldn't be appropriate for a dahlia either um, because it is, of course, colder above ground than it is below ground in the winter. Iris, uh, those are usually very, very hardy, but they need to be in the ground also. Raspberries, people have asked about raspberries going into winter sowing jugs over the winter, and that's not really appropriate either. It would be better if you had raspberry canes at the end of the summer and you were like, oh my God, what am I gonna do with them? Put them into a big planter, um, and put them into your garage, protect them for the winter, they will do better that way than they would as tiny little cuttings in a jug outside where it is very cold. Um, for, for a cane type of cutting, it's not gonna work. The, the canes will rot. And then acorns too, that came up in a question uh, on the Facebook page. And no, acorns are, they are seed, but they're just a little bit too big there are other more appropriate methods of starting native seeds like acorns and getting them to grow. And um, I'm not sure that they would winter so well. I, I think that they would just get waterlogged and rot. Places to find some more information, uh, wintersown.org, that's Trudy's website. And the seed site is a great site to get germination rates. TomClothierHort.net is a great site and winter sowing on Facebook. Um, it's actually winter sowers on Facebook. Yeah, it's not winter sowing, it's winter sowers. That's our group. Sorry, I misspelled that. 
Uh, so let's review a couple of things. Winter sewing is super easy. Don't overthink it. Use materials that you already have at your house. Don't spend a lot of money. Um, enjoy doing this and, and try a few different kinds of methods. Try different containers. Try different kinds of tape. Sow seeds at the beginning, sow seeds at the end. See what comes out better. Have some fun with it. Keep a little journal. Keep a small notebook with some notes in it um, and teach someone else how to win or sew. Spread the joy, spread the love, spread the gardening. Make sure everybody gets a chance to garden. Help them out. Collect jugs for them if you have to. But um, the more people gardening, the more people care about the earth, more people care about nature. And I think that is what the real takeaway is, is that um, this is easy and we should share it with other people. Let's go to our questions in the chat. Let's see. Kim, are you on? Are you and Mickey going to read these questions for me or? Yeah, we can. Um, I can do this. You want me to do it? Whoever Mickey. wants to do it. You do. We can take turns if you want. All right, Mickey's been. I have some of them answer. written down. Okay, and Mickey's been um, answering some of the questions. Oh, great. So, yeah, but we probably should just say some of them out loud in case. That's um, right. We have one. Oh, Kim, I'm sorry. Do you want to start or shall no, I? No, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, we have one question, Jolly. You have one question about um, camellia and bay laurel. The question is, um, can these seeds be winter sown? Uh, camellia and bay laurel are both southern species of tree. And I don't think that winter sowing is going to be appropriate for them unless you're actually doing it in southern, like in Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, where those trees actually grow, although I don't know camellia grows in North Carolina. Um, if, you're, if you're doing winter sowing in the region where those trees grow naturally, then the winter will be appropriate for it. It would not be appropriate up here because weather like we're having right now, where it's only about 10 degrees outside over the overnight and then uh, below zero wind chill, that would not be appropriate for those seeds and they probably wouldn't make it up here. But if you're in Georgia, they probably will be. Okay, the next question is from Nicholas Polinski, and he asked, um, actually he sent a link, an Amazon link, asking you if this is the permanent outdoor garden marker that you recommend. And you is may want to go look at that link. Is it called the garden marker? If it's called the garden marker, Nick, then yeah, it is. Okay, Nicholas, you'll have to go back and look at that. Um, the next question is, um, from Patty, do the seeds remain uncovered in the jugs or containers? When you're going to cover your seeds, you're going to use the recommended depth of seed um, that comes with either your seed packet or information from the internet about your seed. Like if you get the seeds in a swap and you don't get that information, just look it up at another seed company. So the rule of thumb for seeds though is that the larger the seed, the more soil needs to go over the top of it. So like the, those very large sunflower seeds, I think I put about a half an inch of soil over the top of those seeds. But if I was gonna sow poppy seeds, they go right on top of the soil, just like it would say on any seed package for poppies. They're so small, they're like dust, they need light to germinate, so they go on the top. So. In, re in regards of the soil depth and how much to put on top or whether to put the seeds on the top of the soil, go with the recommendations from a seed package. That's probably the only thing on a seed package that you need when it comes to winter sowing. Okay, um, the next question is, um, someone had asked if you could explain the last thermometer that you talked about. Oh, um, there's a type of thermometer that is made to use if you are using a grill and it looks like a gun without a barrel on it. So it has a trigger and you point it at the grill and it instantaneously within one second reads the temperature and it can read the temperature up to like seven or 800 degrees and then down real cold too. Um, and so I think that I think that might be really fun to try and do to, to measure how hot it gets inside of a jug because nobody's ever talked about it. I don't know if everybody's 
anybody's done it yet. So I'm going to try it this year. So they're available on Amazon. They're anywhere from about um, $20 to up to about $80 or $100. The one that I bought was $23. It was just one of the ones that had good, re good reviews, but was not terribly expensive. And if you use a grill or you... Um, you know, have any other kind of need for knowing the temperature of something, then it, it works really well. It's not the, yeah. it's not appropriate for like measuring the temperature of a turkey or anything like that, because that has to be internal. Okay. Um, another question is, can trillium, native trillium, may apple and ginger be winter sown? Only if you are using the seeds. You know, if you have the trillium tubers, the bulbs, then those have to go in the ground or in a pot in the garage for the winter. So they're safe. Um, I, I'm pretty sure that they would be too wet and they would probably rot in a winter sown container. Okay, and then Kim asked, are holes needed along the top of the containers? It seems to be something new this, this time around. Actually, Trudy only recommends the vents around the top if you are going to spring sow and those jugs are going to go and have the covers on them into summer. But for the winter, they really don't need it on a milk jug or a one-gallon water jug. Okay. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And then another question is, um, can dahlia seeds, not the tubers, be winter sown? Yes. Okay. Hey, I um, have one. I have one. Um, what resources would you recommend to determine when and how to harvest seeds and separating from the chafe, etc.? So a good, a good site to go to to figure out how to um, harvest your seeds and clean them. Honestly, I've never found a good website for that. Um, there are a couple of seed books out there. You, why don't you email me? And I can give you some seed sites. And um, I also, I have a lecture on cleaning seeds and collecting seeds. Um, I just haven't had anywhere to give it. So sometime maybe I'll give it and, um, and share that information. Cause it is really useful. And it's, you know, it's not information that's out there in the common knowledge of a lot of gardeners anymore. And I just kind of accidentally mm -hmm. fell into it and started collecting my own seed and then just started learning, you know, new plants and more seed and, you know, that kind of thing. Um, maybe, maybe we'll have to have you back in September or October when it's yeah. time to start harvesting seeds. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe even something earlier like August would be good before native plants are ready. Um, but yeah, I've never found a good website for that. Anything we else? have one more question. And Linda asked, she apparently missed um, how you made the holes in the cap of the water bottle. And she'd like to know how you did that. I have um, kind of a large sewing needle that's really sharp on the end. And I just heat it up in the flame of a candle and then just push it through. You want to wear a glove when you do it because the needle does get hot. But you just have to heat it up in the tip of a candle, in the flame of a candle. And then that plastic on a water bottle is soft enough that you can just push it through. And, you know, about every third hole, you have to heat it up again and then make a few more and then heat it up again. It takes a couple of minutes to do it, but for the most part, it's super simple. Okay, and then there are um, some people responded to um, where you can find information about collecting seeds. For example, Barrington Area Library has a YouTube video on seed saving. Oh, that's great. And, and, um, and Seed Saver Exchange has a wonderful book for collecting. Okay. Now, those two resources, I am going to assume, are for vegetables. Um, and flower seeds and vegetables are, are just a wee bit different um, because of how you're, you're not, 
Yeah, you're not harvesting from a large vegetable fruit or an edible fruit when you're going after flower seeds. So it, there are some nuances with collecting flower seeds that you do need to know um, that you might not get from those two resources. But, you know, you still might. You just have to try it out, check them out, see. Um, oh, Barrington is for flower seeds. Wonderful. I will check it out, Sandy. Thank you so much. And um, oh, Julia, I just saw Julie's comment about where is the best place to put jugs in sun yeah. or shade. Actually, sun is the best for the winter, but if you have nowhere else to put them, just put them outside. And then as it gets closer and closer to spring, try and find a better, more sunny space. But um, I put mine sort of south facing under my pergola so they, they're not in full sun over the winter. Um, but sunnier the better, is my opinion. It appears to be all the questions. That's it? All right. Okay. Oh, seed sample.